Okay, so today I'm going to do the first one of our lectures on Gothic Europe. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of Gothic art and architecture, kind of an overview in general, and then talk about how it looks in France. And then in the next lecture, we'll look at it in, uh, sorry, in uh, Germany and England. Okay? Okay, so let's talk about Gothic Europe. Okay. So as you know, I generally start these off by asking what you know, so you can do a little bit of reflection before we get into the lecture. Um, so a lot of times in my seated classes, when I ask um, this question, what do you know about Gothic art and architecture? I get um, a few answers, not like a ton, but a few. Uh, some people mention gargoyles. Some people mention Notre Dame and Paris. Um, some people mention stained glass, which are all correct uh, answers that do relate to um, Gothic art in general in this period. So I'm going to fill in a little bit of general information and then we're going to talk about kind of an overview of early, high, and late Gothic uh, art and architecture. So the Gothic style starts um, in the French region surrounding Paris called Ile de France. So it's not actually an island, that means island of France, but it's it's kind of this little area in the middle of France that sort of surrounds Paris. Um, and at the time, like many of the movements that we've talked about, the people who were contemporaneous to this movement didn't call it Gothic art and architecture. They called it opus fragium, or French work, or sometimes opus modernum, which means modern work. So this was kind of, um, the modernism of its time, which is sort of interesting to think about. Um, so some characteristics of, of what is um, Gothic, what's Gothic architecture, for example, pointed arch lancets, which is pointed uh, arches that come to a point, uh, and lancets are thin windows. Um, flying buttresses, so in the Romanesque we looked at regular buttresses, which are those attached exterior pillars that support the building from the outside. I'll t tell you about what um, flying buttresses are in a minute. Uh, stained glass, lots and lots of stained glass. Rose windows, which is what you see in the background of this picture of Saint Chapelle, which is a particular kind of uh, stained glass in this sort of uh, round shape. Uh, a triforium, which has to do with the nave elevation, and we'll talk about what that is. Uh, and rib vaults. Okay, so those are some of the main things. Um, Again, like the Romanesque, the contemporary uh, people in the Gothic era did not use the term Gothic. This term was actually coined by uh, Giorgio uh, Versari, who was kind of the first art historian in some respects. He wrote a book called Lives, which is the lives of the artists um, about a lot of Renaissance artists. It's very famous. He also wrote um, Introduction to the Three Arts of Design in 1550. So he's he's quite a bit later than, than the period we're in now. We're in the 12th and 13th century when we're talking about Gothic art. So he's a little later. Um, and he attributed late medieval art and architecture to the Goths, like the Visigoths, who we've talked about a little bit in prior uh, lectures in this class. Um, if you're not in my class and you're confused why I keep saying class, I record these lectures for my art history class and then other people watch them as well, which is totally fine. Um, so Vasari's assessment of Gothic art was very negative. Um, he described it as being barbarous and monstrous. And first of all, he's wrong about who's making it. And second, uh, his opinion is not the opinion that has stood the, st the test of time. It's interesting though, throughout our history, a lot of the phrases, a lot of the terms that we use for different periods and movements in art started out as negative, as, as negative criticisms of those movements. For example, in the 20th century, we have the art movement called Fauvism. If you take Art History 2 with me, we'll talk about Fauvism. Uh, Fauve means wild beast in French. So that was a French critic describing this painting movement as like it's done by wild beasts, and then that stuck. That became their name. So it's kind of an interesting thing. thing same thing with the Baroque, lots of different things. Okay. So, uh, Vasari's not alone in this thought. Uh, a century earlier, Lorenzo Ghiberti, Ghiberti, who's a little closer uh, to the time period than Vasari, said the same thing in his book called Commentaries. So he described the Middle Ages as a period of decline for Europe. And that's sort of familiar, right? That's, we sometimes call the Middle Ages the Dark Ages, right? Um, medieval, the word itself, refers to eras between the good art 
of uh, classicism, so like Greek, Roman stuff that we looked at earlier in the semester, and uh, the Renaissance, which is the beginning of art history too. Um, so originally this was kind of looked down upon as a movement um, by the, the art historians of the past, which is kind of interesting. The modern view, the contemporary view today, is kind of the opposite. Uh, we tend to think of the Gothic period as one of the high points of achievement in Western architecture. So it's interesting how these opinions kind of shift and change over time. Um, contributing factors to why um, this kind of opulent work was, was able to be done are the uh, widespread prosperity in Europe in the 12th and 13th centuries, um, cities becoming even more important and independent. So we talked about that at the beginning of the Romanesque lectures, how um, we sort of see feudalism in decline and the rise of independent cities coming up and building their own buildings, uh, including religious buildings like churches. Um, and then we start seeing in the Gothic that happens even more to the point where cities become the center of intellectual and religious life instead of these isolated monasteries and things and these specific royal courts. It's kind of the cities where all the people are that we start seeing uh, everything abuzz with culture and uh, religious um, pursuit. We also see the development of guilds. Guilds are groups of artists and artisans who um, are like professional groups of people who make art for a living. So not like a monk whose side job as a monk is to paint manuscripts, be a guy uh, and a group of people who uh, their whole job is to paint manuscripts and they're not monks, they're just lay people who know how to paint. So that kind of thing, we see that with uh, sculptors as well and all different kinds of, of people with skills. This is also the advent of the first modern universities. A lot of the universities that were started at this time in Europe are, still exist today. We also see a huge shift in that um, vernacular literature starts being created. That's um, literature being written in the local spoken languages instead of just in Latin or Greek. So in French, for example, which is more accessible to more people. So kind of a wider spread of knowledge of um, people in these concentrated areas where there are books like the cities. Uh, the papacy is at the height of its power. So the Pope is very, very powerful. Uh, the Crusades are still happening. We have independent nations beginning to take shape. We start seeing France kind of look like France. Um, and for Gothic art and architecture, there are three really major um, areas in Europe, and that's France, England, and uh, the Holy Roman Empire, which is Germany, uh, what is now Germany and parts of Italy and, and uh, Austria. Okay, so let's do kind of an overview of what's going on. So here's what the map looks like. And remember, in the second half of this class, there's a lot of overlap. So if you notice in Spain, we have the Umayyad Caliphate. We talked about them several lectures ago when we were talking about Islamic art and architecture. So this is happening contemporaneously to that. Um, so here we have the Kingdom of France, we have the Holy Roman Empire, and then we have England up above. So you can kind of see those are the main areas we're going to be talking about. Today we're just going to talk about France because a lot of the stuff we look at in this unit is in France. Okay, so a little breakdown of some of the important things that happen. The early Gothic, which is 1140 to 1194, uh, as I said, we're in the 12th and 13th centuries in this unit. I think I said that. Um, we have a guy named Abbot Suger who begins rebuilding the French Royal Abbey Church, which is at Saint-Denis, with stained glass windows and rib vaults and pointed arches. So some of those big things that indicate something is Gothic. So he starts sort of pushing this rebuild and this design in a very um, influential way. At Saint-Denis and Chartres Cathedral, jam statues of Old Testament kings and queens adorn all three portals of the west facades. So remember uh, when we were talking about the Romanesque, we looked at the portal, the doors to the cathedral, and how there were sometimes those statues in the jam, that's the, the where the actual door connects to the wall. So those become more prominent and more decorative and uh, the sculptures start to become more and more developed. The builders at Leon Cathedral insert a triforium as the fourth story in the nave elevation. So we're gonna, I'm gonna show you what that means in a minute. Next we have what's categorized as the High Gothic from 1194 to 1300. And the kind of um, really influential building, the textbook sort of for this, is uh, Chartres Cathedral, which 
burns almost completely down. We'll talk about that. And then it's rebuilt. So it's rebuilt at the beginning of the High Gothic. And it sort of sets the pattern for what High Gothic churches are going to look like, which is four part nave vaults uh, braced by external flying buttresses, a three story, three to four story elevation, which is the arcade, the triforium, and the clear story, which I'm going to show you what that looks like. Uh, stained glass windows in place of all the heavy um, stonework, lots and lots of stained glass. And then we also see at Chartres and Rheim and France, uh, at Nuremberg uh, in Germany and elsewhere, statues start to become more independent of their architectural setting. So instead of just being high relief sculptures, they start coming out from the wall to where they're almost sculptures in the round. And then manuscript illumination moves from monastic scriptoria to urban lay workshops, especially in Paris. And that's where we see those guilds come in. Then we have the late Gothic, which is 1300 to 1500. We have the flamboyant style in France and the perpendicular style in England. And they both emphasize the surface embellishment over structural clarity. Um, so instead of only having decorative things that serve some kind of purpose, like the ribs and rib vault are actually structurally significant, we start seeing decorative kind of works, like what you see this uh, fan work behind um, the words in the slide. Characteristic features are delicate webs of flame-like tracery, particularly in the flamboyant style, and fan vaults, particularly in the perpendicular style, with pendants resembling stalactites. Okay. Then we have uh, in sculpture with the humanization of holy figures and statuary, it continues even further, um, especially in Germany where sculptors dramatically record the suffering of Jesus. So some pretty big changes. All right, so today we're going to talk a lot about France. Here we have the uh, rose window of Chartres. Okay, so starting off, we're going to be in Paris and we're going to talk about Saint-Denis. So um, Guy already mentioned Abbot uh, sugar becomes sort of he's an abbot and he also becomes kind of the right hand of King Louis the sixth and King Louis the seventh so King Louis the sixth is the king he decides he wants to go fight in the crusade so while he's away King Louis the seventh has to step in as a uh, regent I guess regent Louis the seventh uh, to, to keep things together while he's away in the crusades <coughs> excuse me and both of them um, are very, very close with Abbot Sugar. So he's able to get lots of funds and resources to redo Saint Denis, which is something that he has really wanted to do for a while. Um, Saint Denis is very significant. It's where most French kings, all the way back to the Morovian times, which we've talked about in this class previously, are buried there. So it's it's a kind of where the royal uh, necropolis, it's where the, the French royalty have been buried for a long time. Uh, Sugar had dreamed of embellishing it since his youth. He's from Paris and he's always wanted to do more with it. He's always felt he could do more with the space. Pardon me, I have a tickle in my throat. So within 15 years of him becoming abbot, so now he's the decision-making guy in this, in this uh, abbey church, he begins an extensive remodel. He wanted to rebuild it in a very grand fashion. So this is in... Um, 1135 he starts planning this and he he doesn't just plan all this he also writes about it so we have all this reflective writing he's done so we we know kind of what he was thinking um it's a very interesting look at the role of the abbot as a patron of the arts uh and one of his lines from this writing is delight in the beauty of the house of god so he's very interested in this idea of bringing beauty into the church and bringing a sense of awe and a feeling of being in paradise or being kind of heavenly or otherworldly in in the church. Um, and the way he thought to do that was to make more windows and much larger windows. He saw the church as kind of a way station on the road to paradise, so he wanted it to not look as much like a mundane earthly thing. So he first rebuilds the western facade and adds more sculpture to the doors, to the portals. Um, and not much of that survives the French Revolution. A lot of that was destroyed. Um, he was very fascinated with this idea of lux nova, which is Latin for new light. And what he meant by new light was light as it filters through stained glass. He thought that this was a way to demonstrate the presence of God and this idea of paradise um, in, in, in the church. Uh, so he has to figure out a way to make bigger windows and more of them to um, 
create all this Lux Nova. He's interested in all this new light. So he uh, consults with different um, structural engineer types and architecture type guys, and they come up with this idea of pointed arches and pointed rib vaults, um, which would are structurally more significant and can hold more weight. So then you're able to um, open up the walls with more and more window space. So here's in that uh, ambulatory, you can see one of the tombs of one of the kings over here. You can see lots of big windows, um, much more so than in the Romanesque, and also all the ribbed vaulting uh, on those groin vaults. Okay, um, Chartres. Chartres uh, is one of my favorite cathedrals. By the way, why? Uh, um, you'll notice in this lecture, that I'm calling all of these cathedrals by the name of the, the town or city they're in. Um, the reason for that is almost all of them are called Notre Dame. <laughs> okay, so we have Notre Dame in Paris. That's the very famous one that uh, mostly was largely damaged in a fire several years ago. So that's the one when we when I say Notre Dame, people think of Paris. But there's a Notre Dame at Chartres, there's one at Rheims, there's one at Amiens, there's one at Léo. <coughs> Most of these churches are called Notre Dame. And the reason for that is um, the Virgin Mary becomes extremely central to the Catholic faith. And so most of these churches are named after her. So Notre Dame in French means Our Lady. And this is a way to refer to um, the Virgin Mary. So a, a, a lot, lot, lot of these churches in Europe are, are named for her. So it's easier just to call them by their city name. So if I don't say the name of the church and I just say the city, assume that the church is called Notre Dame. Okay. Uh, so this is the western facade of Chartres. I love this because, um, as I mentioned, it burns down and is rebuilt. We'll talk about that more later. But one of the towers mostly survives and uh, the other wasn't complete yet. And then the crypt survives and that's kind of it. But so we have this uh, study in how the style changes between the times. So we have this very early Gothic, a little bit still Romanesque tower on one side, and then the much more um, high Gothic tower on the other side, which is pretty interesting for comparison sakes to have both. So the reason I'm showing you this now though, is I want to talk to you about the portal. So this is called the Royal Portal. It's on the west facade of Chartres Cathedral. And here <clears throat> we have these jam statues, which is this idea that comes from Saint-Denis, though I didn't show you that one because they were largely destroyed in the French Revolution. Um, but basically this gets adopted here and then we see this uh, become a very popular um, concept at, at a lot of churches throughout the Gothic period. It's called the Royal Portal because the figures are all kings and queens. Um, you have the Archivalds on the right portal depicting the seven female personifications of the liberal arts. And also we have the learned men of antiquity at their feet. So the seven liberal arts at this time are um, grammar, logic, mathematics, astronomy, um, I think geometry, music, and rhetoric maybe? Something like that. Okay, so anyway, the seven liberal arts of the time and penal personifications are here. Um, we, so we have this visual kind of summa, uh, which is like an encyclopedia of knowledge. The idea is that this human knowledge, which um, they think leads to uh, true faith. So studying the world, studying how it works, leads to a better understanding of God and faith, etc. So that's what this idea is. The capitals across all three doors show scenes from the life of the Virgin and Christ. The left uh, tympanum, we have Christ's ascension to the heavens. Um, the Archivalds are with signs of the Zodiac, which I think is super interesting because we don't really think of Zodiac symbols as being something affiliated with Christianity, but here we have the Zodiac signs um, around Christ's ascension. Um, there's also various depictions of the labor associated with different times of the year. So this comes from a popular kind of book from this time called the Book of Hours. And what this would do was it would show different th ways to pray at different times of the day and different times of the year. So the zodiac tells you what time of year it, these activities, these labor activities are being done. So it's kind of like a um, calendar 
uh, in a lot of ways. So we have symbols of cosmic and the cosmic world, the zodiac, and the earthly world, and Christ's ascension between. So from the earthly world up into the cosmic world where the zodiac are. Kind of interesting. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Uh, the second coming is the second is the central uh, tympanum. On the lintel, we have the signs of the four um, evangelists, not really on the lintel, they're surrounding Christ in majesty, so him is uh, the second coming here, so he's in majesty, he's holding this hand blessing, he has his other hand on uh, the Bible, and we have the symbols of the um, four gospels there around him, uh, the man, the eagle, the ox, and the lion, um, and here he's sitting in judgment in the, the second coming of, of Christ. Um, there's the 24 elders of the apocalypse, the 12 disciples appear around Christ or on the lintel. The right portal is uh, Cetus Sapientiae, which is scenes of Christ's childhood uh, in the lintel. And then we have uh, him sitting on the Virgin Mary's lap as a, as a baby in the center. Okay, so we have Mary in a pretty central role here which makes sense because the church is named after her. She becomes extremely uh, popular as a prominent figure in the Gothic. We have the jam statues are Old Testament kings and queens uh, who are the royal ancestors of Christ. So this is kind of, again, about Christ's ancestry. We have um, this replacement of columns that we had in the Romanesque. We now see it entirely done in caryatids, like the Erechtheon um, back in ancient Greece in the Acropolis. But here we have caryatids of biblical figures. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, why these pointy arches are so important structurally in the Gothic. So one, it makes everything appear taller and everything is sort of pushing upwards, like pushing towards the heavens, praising God, this idea. And then also the most important aspect is that it channels more weight directly downward. Because of that, they're able to add greater fenestration, more windows, <coughs> and larger windows. So that's really important. It also allows the vaulting of car compartments of various sizes. Okay, so it's more adaptable because it's stronger. All right, let's look at something else. So this is uh, Leon Cathedral. This has begun in 1160. It's finished in 1200. So it gives the complete construction story of a Gothic church because it's all built in the Gothic period. So um, Saint Denis is added onto during the Gothic period. It's redone. Chartres, we have it burned down. So we have some in one part of the Gothic, some in the other, a little bit of Romanesque in there. But this one is made start to finish in the Gothic period. The nave bays have sexpartite rib vaults, which becomes very typical of uh, Gothic churches. All of it is um, pointed. We have all these pointed arches everywhere, very Gothic. Uh, groin vaulted gallery above the aisles. We do still have an alternate support system, um, which we've seen before in the Romanesque. But the new thing that we have that's pretty exciting is a triforium. So this is a band of arcades below the clear story. So the clear story is uh, the windows up the top. And then that layer right below, that short layer of um, uh, columns, that arcade, that's new. That's the triforium. And that becomes pretty standard in the Gothic. So this is the first time we see that, which is pretty cool. We have this Gothic desire to break up all the continuous wall surfaces and put in as many windows and as much light as possible. Um, Okay, so when we look at the west facade, we have a rose window, which is another big thing for Gothic churches. We have these really deep porches uh, that allows for more sculptural development uh, in the portals. We have an open structure on the towers. There, it's more pierced, there's more windows, there's more decorative things, there's gargoyles everywhere up there. Um, so we are reducing the sheer mass that's associated with the Romanesque and replacing it with these intricately framed voids where we can put lots of stained glass and windows. That's kind of the Gothic vibe. Take away as much stone as possible and put in colorful glass. Okay, you'll notice I, I don't talk about Notre Dame uh, Paris at all in this lecture and that's because one of you will be assigned it during the discussion. Um, okay, so Let's look 
at so we'll skip Notre Dame Paris for now and we'll come back to another Notre Dame which is Notre Dame Chartres which is what this is it's kind of an interesting view looking down the nave and into one of the transepts uh, so in 1194 Chartres burns down almost completely the facade which was not quite complete and the crypt remain and that's all um, the most precious relics, including the mantle of the Virgin, which is like the Virgin's uh, clothing, survive. They're in the crypt and they survive miraculously, which kind of lends them more esteem in terms of, of relics because they survived this catastrophic fire. Um, they rebuild it over the next 27 years. The rebuild is generally considered the first high Gothic building. So Léon we think of as an early Gothic building and the rebuild of Chartres is the first high Gothic building. Um, we have a new kind of building. We have a uh, rectangular uh, bays in the nave, not square, which is different. We have uh, a single square in each aisle rather than the two flanks. Um, this becomes kind of the standard plan in, in the High Gothic. The interior is unified. We have a series of identical units. Um, so there's no more of this alternating support system from the Romanesque where you have like a pier and a column and a pier and a column and a pier and a column. It's all the same all the way down. Um, this is the first church planned from, planned from its inception to have flying buttresses. So they weren't added later in a rebuild. It had flying buttresses incorporated from the beginning. Because of this, the tribune above the aisle could be eliminated. Okay, so there could be even more stained glass. Here's just a look from below, looking up. Pretty fabulous looking. All right. So um, I like this illustration because it points out a lot of the um, really important features here and a lot of the things that make it really uh, a great example of the High Gothic. So one of the main things I'll point out are these flying buttresses. So remember buttresses, when you look toward the, the, the back, those are the uh, supports that are attached directly like this, that are just sort of like big pillars. Flying buttresses come out like this, so you can see them labeled. They're stacked like this and they extend like that. That becomes uh, one of the standard things to look for if you're trying to decide if something is Gothic or Romanesque. Okay. So here's a look at those flying buttresses. This is a view from above, so you can see the apse with the radiating chapels with all these flying buttresses attached. And here's just a close look at those buttresses. Pretty cool. This is a map of some of the more famous uh, stained glass. So one of the um, big features here is uh, the rose window. This one in the north transept is probably the most famous of its uh, rose windows. Um, so this thing is 43 feet in diameter. So I like to give you that as an idea of scale because we're about to talk about how the stained glass is made. So that's massive. It's a massive thing. Think about that. 43 feet across that rose window to give you a sense of the scale. I just include this because I think it's neat. So we have all kinds of things um, from the Bible and depicted in the windows, of course, that makes sense, it's a church. But this is a really nice little thing in the um, in one of the chapels in the ambulatory in Chartres. So it's a little bit hard to see, but this is uh, stonemasons and sculptors. So we have stonemasons putting the stones together to make the structure of the building. And then we have these two sculptors with a chisel and a hammer carving some of the sculptures that are going to adorn the building. So it's this nice little tribute to some of the the artisans, some of the people who made uh, the cathedral what it was, which I think is kind of cool. Okay, let's learn how to make stained glass. First of all, if uh, any of you have Netflix, there is a show on Netflix called Blown Away. It's kind of dorky, it's a reality competition show, but it's glass blowers competing with each other. So if you're not familiar how blowing glass works, um, that's, that's a thing that, that can show you how to do it. There's also a million YouTube videos and things. But let's talk about how to do it. So stained glass is not a Gothic invention. Uh, the Romans had it, the Egyptians had it, the um, Kushites had it. glass, they all had colorful glass, okay? Um, various colors of glass that they were able to make. But in the Gothic period, it's used in new ways and there's way more of it. So the ancient uses were more like um, for jewelry embellishment or to, to make like um, 
things to drink out of like glasses and things like this but in the gothic period it becomes um widespread used in, in lots and lots of churches and at a great scale unlike mosaic and fresco glass uh, doesn't cover the walls, it replaces them, which is just kind of a totally different way to think about um, structure and decoration and how, how to embellish um, spaces. It transmits light, it also transforms that light into this lux nova, right, the new light, because it filters through the color, and so you have this glowy thing and this beautiful light coming through. And think about this, this is before electricity, before television, before anything like that. So you're used to things having some windows, but they're pretty small. And if there's glass in them, which there isn't always, it's clear. And then you come in and have this totally otherworldly, illuminated, beautiful kind of experience. I mean, it, it, this kind of blew people's minds. This was a pretty big deal. Um, and the idea uh, behind all this and why it was so important is that the true light or the true sun um, is, is like showing God, basically, uh, which is like enlightenment. So the glass is acting as sort of a medium for the scripture. So we have these didactic panels that tell stories from the Bible and they're being illuminated with God's light. Okay, so that's part of the impetus between creating so much of this. Um, and gl stained glass windows existed as early as the 4th century, but it wasn't very widespread and it definitely wasn't anything like this scale. Okay, so Theophilus um, was a German monk and he recorded the process of making stained glass windows in 1100. So this comes from him. So first thing is you have to have someone who can draw, design the composition and draw it all out, which would be drawn out on uh, wood on a big board. Then the glass blowers have to provide all these flat sheets of each color of glass. They give that to the glaziers. The glaziers cut the glass with special iron shears and they have to cut it all by hand into the right shapes and they have to be very careful not to break it because it's quite you know, expensive to, to use. Then painters come in and add the little details in the enamel. This is like little fingers, the expressions on the faces. If you see like shifts in color in the clothing for folds and stuff, that's all painted enamel. Then the glaciers have to heat the glass to fuse the enamel, but they can't get it so hot that the glass melts again. So it's a very particular persnickety thing. Then the glaciers leaded the various fragments of glass together. So they put it together like a puzzle on this composition and then they have to pour molten lead to make it all fuse together. Finally, the glaciers strengthen the panel with armature an armature of iron, ba uh, iron bands. So that's those very straight bands you see on there that are holding it together. Um, and also the masons, the guys cutting the stone for the window where it's going to go, have to make it exactly right so that it will fit, right? So it's a really tedious, really wild uh, process to create these things, which I think is pretty incredible to think about. Okay, so um, Chartres, amazingly, still today in 2021 is when I'm recording this, has almost all of its original stained glass, which is incredible. I mean, it's, you know, that's, that's amazing <laughs> like it's all it's almost all entirely still in place which is pretty crazy uh, and the glass there was paid for by workers guilds and by royalty so it was sponsored by two very different groups of people which was kind of neat a uh, wide range of patrons uh, okay let's look at some sculpture so the way sculpture changes in the gothic period is pretty radical. So think about in the last lecture on the Romanesque how we had that um, that sculptural figure I showed you where the guy's like all kind of contorted like this and has very very long legs and it's all kind of twisted around. It didn't look very realistic right? It looked very elongated and exaggerated and then this kind of impossible sort of pose. Well look at Theodore here. This looks like a person. It looks pretty realistic. The folds in his clothes look like they adhere to the earthly rules of physics. He looks proportionally more or less accurate. He looks like a human person in a pose that's comfortable that a human would stand in. Then look at the people next to him. They also look pretty much like actual people. So we see this return to an interest in naturalism 
in sculpture, and we also see that the sculpture becomes more and more and more in the round, like more and more detached from the wall. So it's still attached to the wall, but it's a much more complete, almost in the round figure. Now at this point, their faces all look fairly similar. They have pretty stoic faces. They look proportionally accurate, but they don't necessarily look like identifiable individuals yet, but they look much, much more realistic, much, much more uh, naturalistic which is pretty cool. So this is these are very good examples of the High Gothic spirit, which we think of as being from 1220 to 1230. Um, it's more independent from the wall, as I said, and you can see that Theodore is standing in a contrapposto stance, which is kind of a callback to classicism, as is the naturalistic posing and the accurate proportions. So we start seeing a return to some of these classical ideals away from the ideas of the flatness and the kind of contortion of the Byzantine and uh, Romanesque periods. Okay, let's look at some elevations here. So um, we have uh, several Notre Dames. <laughs> okay, we have Léon is the first one. You can see the um, arches are fairly rounded still, but it's starting to get a little bit pointed. It's starting to get a little toward um, this this early Gothic idea, we have some stained glass, not a ton of stained glass, but some stained glass. Then we look at Paris, this is the Notre Dame that you've all probably heard of, and you see there's an extra layer of uh, space for glass in there, the arches are much more pointed, we have larger windows, more stained glass, we're also up to a 115 foot hall nave. 115 feet is pretty high. That's a that's a very high elevation. And remember, this is pre any kind of machinery. And unlike the Romans who used concrete, they're making all of this in, out of very, very, very heavy stone. So it's pretty incredible. Well, then we step it up again, go to Chartres. Uh, this is 120 feet high with much more stained glass, much bigger windows. We have a triforium in full effect here. That's that little line of... Um, it's a little arcade between the clear story and the uh, nave um, support system. And then look at Amiens, which we're going to talk about next. This thing is 144 feet high. It's still standing. You can go to Amiens, France and walk in this thing and be completely blown away and amazed that this thing uh, exists still. It's pretty incredible. All right, so let's look at Amiens. Um, so Chartres, which we've talked about quite a lot already, is partially because I really like Chartres, but also because it's quite important. Chartres is one of the most influential buildings in the history of architecture. Um, a lot of important engineering discoveries are made with the rebuild of that building. Amiens uh, is one of the buildings that's very influenced by that structure. So they start working on it in uh, 1220. Uh, and then they finish the nave in 1235 or 6. They finish the radiating chapels around, along the apse in the back in 1247. And uh, the choir in that part of the church is done in about 1270. This has more windows than Chartres, partially because it's so high, they have more space, and because uh, they have all these flying buttresses, so they're able to support more fenestration or more um, openings for, for windows. We have rectangular bays, like Chartres. We have ribbed groin vaults, also like Chartres. The skeletal frame reaches the full maturity, really, as I see it in, in Amiens, where we have this, um, the flying buttresses go all the way down the back of the nave, out into the transepts even, where everything is being supported by the structural kind of skeletal uh, frame of, of stonework on the outside of the building. So um, Amiens, I said that the nave elevation is 144 feet high, very, very high. At uh, Beauvais, which is like a city over from Amiens, they try to go for an even larger and even higher nave. They try to get up to 157 feet that is a mistake. It crumbles and kills everyone. So then nobody tries to go higher than 144 feet. It was sort of decided that Amiens was the height of the High Gothic and going higher was dangerous. Um, we have, let's look at the inside. So this is the inside. As you can see, I put some figures in here for scale. I mean, it's just, it's completely dwarfing being in there. It's this incredible, uh, incredible space. And the ribs, the tracery of the inside, it feels almost like being inside some kind of really intricate 
like shell or something. It's really interesting looking. Uh, this is the facade. So you can see that as we get further into the High Gothic, it's not so much pointy spires on the Westwork anymore. There's more this sort of rectangular capping off, but lots and lots of fenestration, lots and lots of sculptural decor. Look at how deep these porches are to make room for more and more sculpture, more jam sculpture, more sculpture in the archivolts, this kind of thing. And we're going to look at a particular sculpt. Oh, here, I forgot I put this in here. This is looking up uh, at the crossing. Those are the transepts on either side. So you can see that kind of beautiful shell-like internal structure. Okay, so now we're going to look at this particular sculpture because I think it's kind of um, funny and you know I like things like that. So this is the um, front door, so right there. Uh, and this is the central sculpture, the uh, Trimo sculpture between the doors, if you remember your vocabulary from the last lecture in the Romanesque. And the name of this particular sculpture, which is uh, Christ giving the blessing, he's holding the Bible in one hand, has his fingers in the little like pew pew, like he's shooting up at the sky, that's the blessing symbol. In the other hand, this is called beau de. What does beau de mean? Well, uh, in my CETA class this semester, literally no one has taken French, so I will translate it for you. Beau de means beautiful God. And uh, so we have all these pilgrimage routes left over from, from the Romanesque. And at this time, word spreads about this super hot Jesus sculpture. And people come from far and wide to see this thing. He's not exactly my type. I, I, I don't quite see it, I guess. But uh, he, this sculpture has the name Baudu because uh, it was thought that this was very handsome, very beautiful sculpture of, of uh, Jesus, which is, again, I think, sort of funny. Uh, so if you look at this, he's almost in the round, like the ones that we were looking at at Chartres. He's just lightly detached at the back, um, and the drapery of his clothing looks very realistic, like physics actually exists, unlike everything in the Byzantine and Romanesque. If you notice the detail uh, under his feet, he is standing on a lion and a dragon, well, as I've told you, the uh, Crusades are still going on at this time. If you think back to me talking about Alhambra in uh, Spain, the caliphate that made their um, their structure, their mosques and things there, uh, they had the court of the lions because the lion was the symbol of the uh, Muslim Arabic power in their, their um, conquering of Europe. So we have this Christian symbol, the, the Christ standing on a lion. That's not by accident. That's um, a message about the Crusades and, and this, this need that they felt they had to go back and retake the Holy Land and all this. The dragon under the other foot. The dragon, as we talked about when we looked at some of the um, manuscripts from the Romanesque period, is a general symbol for chaos. Um, outside of Christendom. So this is sort of our hot Jesus is standing on top of the lion and the dragon showing that though he's very benevolent and, and isn't as scary as the Jesus of the Second Coming that we see in our Romanesque sculptures uh, of portals going into church to kind of scare you into going into church, he's more benevolent, he's more welcoming, but he's still going to like tramp down these quote unquote evils of the world, etc. Da, 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 da. Okay, <coughs> so Kind of a different approach. All right, this is uh, Rheim Cathedral. Again, it's also Notre Dame. All of these cathedrals are called Our Lady. Um, we have a big difference in the portals here, and that is that the uh, tympana, the, te the tympanum being the singular, above the portals are now stained glass instead of being solid sculpture. So let's look back. See, solid sculpture all the way through the Romanesque up to now. And now, we have a little rose window down there, right? So that's a pretty big change. Um, these start to look a lot alike as, as we go through them, so I'm not gonna spend a ton of time talking about Rheem. It's a perfectly beautiful cathedral, just like all the other ones. But the big thing is we have this more stained glass over the portal. So we have kind of a double rose window effect. This is what it looks like from the inside. And then I really just wanna zoom in on some of the sculpture here because we're seeing these become increasingly in the round. These are so in the round that some of their little hands and arms have been knocked off over the centuries. 
um, but you can see they're not bound by an architectural um, kind of holding area up at the top. They're just standing on little pedestals, so they're almost entirely in the round coming off the front of this uh, cathedral. And this is um, two separate stories. You can tell that each pair was done by a different artist. They're stylistically different. And you can tell that the one on the right is uh, newer and had more interest even in naturalism than the ones on the left. So first we have the Annunciation. That's when uh, the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and says, knock, knock, hey, you're pregnant. You're going to give birth to God. She's like, what are you talking about? And that whole thing happens. Uh, so that's happening on the left. Then on the right, in this, the later pair of sculptures, we have Mary again. So the figure on the left here is uh, the Virgin Mary when she is pregnant. And in the visitation, she's going to visit her cousin, um, Elizabeth is her cousin's name. And her cousin is also pregnant. She's pregnant with John the Baptist. So he and Jesus are uh, cousins. Um, but you can look at the draperies here, how much more detail there is. You can tell that this artist was looking at classical sculpture. This looks very much like classical sculpture from um, the Hellenistic period in Greece. Okay, so we're again getting more of this interest in naturalism, interest in realism, which makes sense because we're getting kind of heading toward the Renaissance where all of that comes back around. Okay, this is my favorite uh, example of stained glass in the world. Being someone who teaches art history, any of my friends who are going to Europe are always like, Megan, what are some things I should see if I go to Paris? And I tell every single one of them to go here and not a single one of them has ever. So if you go to Paris, don't just go to Notre Dame, go to Saint-Chapelle. Saint-Chapelle is the coolest place to see stained glass in the world. It won't be as crowded because it's not as famous. Um, and it's, it looks like this, it's unbelievable. It's, it's nickname is the Jewel Box. It's, it's incredibly beautiful. It's built by uh, Louis IX, my favorite of the Louis, not that that matters to anyone but me. Um, it's on Ile de Cité, which is the same island that uh, Notre Dame is on. So when you go to Notre Dame and just walk across the street over by the courts and go to Saint-Chapelle, the whole building is basically a reliquary. In the Romanesque, we talked about reliquaries, which is the holding of uh, sacred relics, right? So Louis IX buys the crown of thorns from his cousin, Baldwin II, who was a, he was the emperor, um, where was he? He was the emperor of Constantinople at the time. Um, he buys some other relics too, but the crown of thorns is the big one, obviously, you know, that was worn by Christ at the crucifixion, da 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 so Louis IX um, is eventually declared a saint. So he, he was a very, um, considered a very good ruler and also a, a very holy ruler. Um, he's revered for his uh, piety, his justice, his honesty, and his charity. He uh, was not beheaded by his people. He was very uh, good to his people. He was also very good to art, which is why I like him. Um, he negotiated a, tr a treaty with Henry III of England. He's um, sent as a peacemaker and a negotiator all over Europe. If you care about history, he's an interesting guy. Look him up. But basically, he dies in the Crusades in uh, Tanzania. He's buried at Saint-Denis, like most of the, the kings of France. Um, he has a ton of kids. Um, anyway, so he is the patron, the main patron of the Rayonnant style. So this is one of the two French styles in the late Gothic. Rayonnant uh, is, is dominant during this time. It's the French word for radiant. Um, and it's dominant for about, for kind of the second half of the 13th century. So in, this is the best example of Rayonnant. It's the only one I'm going to show you because it's the only one that matters. Um, this Saint-Chapelle has 6,450 feet of stained glass. 6,450 square feet of stained glass in this one little church. It's unbelievable. It's quite small compared to everything else we've looked at, but it's really lovely. Uh, the mullions, that's the little bit of stone in between for support, are kind of dainty, right? It's 49 feet high, it's 15 feet wide, and it has the largest windows of its time. Uh, the largest uninterrupted panes of glass of any example that you will find, actually. So if you're in Paris, go to Saint-Chapelle. Then email me and tell me you did, because nobody ever does. 
Okay, this is looking up uh, at the ceiling of the nave. You can see it's, it's tiny. It's not a cathedral. It's just a chapel, but it's, it's pretty lovely. Okay, this is a sculpture that's quite uh, famous. It's called the Virgin of Paris. It's from the 14th century. Notice in her body how she has this kind of S curve. You can also see this while you're on El de Lasti, near uh, when you're going to Saint-Chapelle or Notre Dame. It's right in front of Notre Dame. Um, I don't believe it was damaged in the fire. I don't actually know that, but I don't think it was. It's outside of uh, the cathedral. Um, and look at her face. We have this more tender kind of humanized face. We have this gentle S curve to her body. This is really looking forward into the Renaissance where we see the works of people like Botticelli who have these soft feminine kind of faces with these gentle S curves, but still have this attention to the realism of the drapery. Um, okay, let's see. We're gonna talk about Saint Maclou, which is at Rouen in France. Um, it was built between 1500 and 1514, which is kind of late, uh, but we're going to talk about it because I want to tell you about the flamboyant style and it is the best example of the flamboyant style. Um, this is named, it's the, the French word for flame-like. Um, and so it's named for the flame-like appearance of its pointed bar tracery which is all that sculptural work. Keep in mind, this is all carved out of stone. So think about carving that, it's pretty incredible. Uh, it's in Rouen, which is uh, the capital of Normandy, so Northern France, right? It's 75 feet high by 180 feet long in its nave. Here's the nave. So the inside looks fairly typical of uh, other high Renaissance um, cathedrals that are a little earlier than it. Um, but if you look at the outside, you have this ornate kind of tracery, these very thin little uh, pieces of masonry um, that are really just kind of decorative, okay? So there's the structural stuff that's happening underneath is kind of masked by these decorative, almost web-like um, mason uh, traceries that are put over it. Uh, and it also makes the church look a little bigger than it is. It's not as big as some of the other ones. You also notice that on the facade, it bows outward so that there can be more portals with more sculpture. And instead of uh, the west work, the two kind of uh, towers on the facade that we've seen in most of the Gothic and Romanesque churches being the focus, we have one singular tower with a very high spire, and then we have all of these portals, so more and more sculpture. Okay, uh, we are going to talk a bit about painting. Um, so books at this time do something interesting. So up until this point, we've almost in almost all books have been made by uh, monks or nuns, right? Um, a very famous kind of big hit number one seller in Europe is published uh, in 1310. Um, and that's Dante's uh, Divine Comedy, and in it, it refers to Paris as the city famous for the art of illumination. So in Dante's book, Dante's Italian, where he's talking about Paris, it's known as the city for the art of illumination. This is part of how Paris gets its nickname that it still has today, which is the city of lights. It really comes from this word illumination, which didn't actually mean light, it meant painting manuscripts. And that is because during the Gothic period, there's a big shift from monasteries being the producers of books to urban workshops being the producers of books. So books are sold to the royal family, they're sold to scholars, and then they're sold to merchants who sell them to gasp normal people. This is really where we start to see normal people being able to buy books, which is not something that's been very possible for most people up until this point. Um, we have in Paris at this time the forerunners to publishing houses and they're making things uh, one of the more popular things that they're producing are called uh, moralized Bibles. They're very heavily illustrated because again at this time the populace is still largely illiterate right so we have what's the word again didactic we have very didactic uh, narrative images that are telling the stories of the Bible visually for people who don't know how to read or don't know how to read very well. 
um, and they don't just illustrate the stories, they also illustrate the moral significance. So you can see in this moralized Bible, we have these images. This is from Genesis, from when the, the world is being constructed. And we have these images that go right next to the lines of text that are kind of trying to show what the text says. Um, and in workshops, it's kind of interesting. Different artists specialize in different things. So the, there'd be one person who did all the drawing, all the line work. Then there'd be one person who did all the painting. Then there'd be one person who did all the gold leaf. There would be one person who did all the script, all the writing. So it becomes a sort of little factories putting out these books. We see some pretty significant stylistic changes from the Romanesque, though everything is still not completely realistic. Um, all right, let's look closer at this. So this is God as the creator of the world. I like this one from a moralized Bible um, that was produced in Paris, because if you look at what he's doing, he's creating the universe and what is he using? He's using a Gothic era uh, architectural compass. So it's very much like the secular guy whose job is to draw things in these books. It's like, all right, I'm supposed to show God creating the world. How do people create things? Well, my brother's an architect and he uses one of these. And so it's this very practical kind of approach to making these didactic illustrations to explain processes to people who are just normal people, not clergy members. Uh, this one, we have um, another illustration, and in this one I just, you can see it's getting more realistic, right? More detailed, we have all these little um, bugs and birds and floral things that all look quite realistic. Uh, we have this fine tracery, there's some interest in um, linear perspective if you look at the architectural detail there. So we're starting to get pushed further and further into what things are going to look like painting-wise in the Renaissance. Uh, this is one of the last things we're gonna look at. So this is a personal sketchbook of an artist from the time who designed, he was one of the guys who designed windows um, before they were filled with glass. And so this is a diagram he had. His name is Villard de Hanacor. And so he's doing these examples showing how it's easier to draw figures and animals uh, if you base them on geometric shapes, which is something we still kind of do in drawing today as someone who also teaches drawing, showing these kind of breakdowns. So this is the first record that we have of this, and it's kind of interesting to see this personal sketchbook, which was quite a luxury, because books were very expensive. Uh, vellum was quite expensive. So it's a whole sketchbook full of his drawings like this, but then there's a few pages like this where he's also written at the bottom explaining that this is um, a way to teach other people how to draw, which is pretty interesting. Uh, okay, the last thing we're going to talk about is this. So this is a small personal jewelry box. It's the lid of a jewelry box, and it was made in Paris. And the reason I want to stop here is I'm going to do a smaller lecture telling you about um, how the Gothic architecture translates into secular buildings, because there were secular buildings built in the Gothic style, and this is a secular uh, piece as well. So this is called, uh, called the Castle of Love. So there were secular objects made, particularly in these uh, workshops of guild members in the cities. This one's inspired by uh, literature of the time. It's um, a poem called The Romance of the Rose, which is by uh, Gilmer de Lory, and it was written in 1225. So this is about, um, a story where Gothic knights attempt to capture love's fortress by shooting flowers from their bows and, and arrows, you know, shooting flowers with their bows instead of arrows and hurling baskets of flowers over the top. Um, the sides of the box illustrate the allegory of the unicorn, which was a symbol of virtue. I just think it's kind of charming. I think it's interesting to see these secular pieces because we have so much from the Gothic and Romanesque period that just revolves around the religious aspect of things and the church as patron. So these artists were also making these kind of things. And as we have this development of more secular uh, people who are artists in the cities, we see more of these kind of things um, that are not uh, to do with the church or the church's patron, which is kind of interesting. And I just think it's charming that they're shooting flowers with their bows and it's kind of a neat thing. Okay, so next time we'll talk about secular architecture in the Gothic period, and then we'll talk about uh, the Gothic period in Germany and England. Okay.